Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the last session of the CEDAR Public Interest Technology Forum, which has been a most amazing couple of days. Uh, my name is Karen Cooman. I'm Director of Government and Regulatory Affairs for IBM Australia New Zealand, and I'm joined with a fabulous panel here today. Um, we've got Professor Mal Thatcher, who's a Professor of Practice at QUT Business School and the QUT Graduate School of Business. So welcome, Mal. Uh, Simon Goodrich is the founder of Portable, um, which is a technology and design company um, that uh, has a number of uh, fascinating projects, including one that's just won the um, uh, National Eye Awards for Best Government and Public Sector that tries to help uh, families uh, avoid um, uh, lawyers in the uh, turmoil of uh, the whole family law environment. So welcome, Simon. Um, Alex Lynch, um, who manages uh, government and regulatory affairs, sorry, government and public policy, I'm sorry, for Google Australia. Um, and he's worked in that role and similar roles for over a decade. And prior to doing that, he uh, worked for the um, public sector in New Zealand on matters of national security. And then we also have uh, Faye Akendoyumi, who's a partner at Newgate. And Faye has over 20 years experience in the communications uh, industry, um, locally and internationally, um, and has worked with uh, some of um, the world's biggest uh, uh, tech clients, advising them on communication strategies. So welcome to you all, um, and thank you for joining me in this last session. And I have to say, I think I've got the hardest job, or we jointly have the hardest job. It has been the most incredible couple of days, dealing with some absolutely fascinating issues that face us um, as citizens, as representatives, representatives of industry, as, as uh, members of the tech industry, and just uh, people interested in good public policy outcomes. I just want to touch on a couple of things before I go to, um, to, to the panel. Some of the highlights for me um, um, come from the, over the last couple of days. Uh, you know, one, one is um, that the role of innovation is to build good stuff. So technology should always help us add to our lives and do good. And if it's harmful, we shouldn't use it. And I think it was Matt Beard who gave the great example of the exploding toaster, right? It doesn't matter that it's cheap, it's easy to produce, it's easy to distribute, even, even fairly distribute. If it's dangerous and it causes harm, it shouldn't be used. So I thought that was, uh, that was an interesting starting point in a lot of ways. Um, and so then how do we go from that concept of creating good tech to actually delivering an outcome? It's not just about a good intention or an ethical intention for that matter. It's actually about creating uh, uh, um, outcomes that really do deliver what they say they're going to deliver and that there is some recourse for individuals affected or businesses for that matter if it doesn't deliver uh, what it said it would deliver. Um, there was uh, the great uh, sort of statement of uh, trust is not built, but it's bestowed. Okay, um, Hilary uh, Sutcliffe mentioned that, which I think it, it is a gift that can be given and it can also be taken away. Um, and, um, and then Ed Santo, um, who's the Human Rights Commissioner, just made some you know, very valuable observations about the fact that this is not a, land, a dry landscape um, with nothing. There are laws that exist, discrimin discrimination and anti-discrimination laws, exist. Um, there are privacy laws that exist. But he went on to make the observation that, um, that there is perhaps an undue focus on privacy, um, whereas perhaps there are other harms that are even more dangerous or insidious or damaging. Uh, discrimination, the exclusion of people with disabilities or other minority groups. You know, so there, there are, you know, that was an interesting thing, particularly as privacy has, um, you know, really come to the fore with um, GDPR and the rollout globally of that standard and our own reviews here in Australia. And then um, I'll just jump over some absolutely brilliant discussion, but to mention something that, um, that uh, Bill Simpson-Young um, just stated just an hour ago, and that was um, that he is at the Gradian Institute, um, is at the you know, the cutting edge of actually um, dealing with data scientists and training and trying to teach them about ethics. And, you know, he said that a lot of data scientists um, don't know and don't think about building AI systems ethically from his actual practical experience. And when they actually are, their mind is, 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 um, is 
turns to this issue, they think, oh, my goodness, you know, well, what are the things I've already done? Uh, it's great that they want to implement, you know, ethics and, and uh, public interest in what they're doing moving forward. But this is not just a conceptual thing. This is, you know, that, that we cannot assume, um, and he, you know, had real examples um, that, um, that the public interest is being built into technology because uh, people don't necessarily know how to do that. And even experts, and there are many that have been in the last couple of days, um, we also don't know exactly how to do it. But coming from all different backgrounds, um, we have some insight, some expertise, some, uh, some background to share on how we might start that journey. And so that's, um, that's uh, sort of where we, we are at this session. just wanted to bring in um, uh, some of our panel to talk about how we actually do move forward at this point. Um, hard as that will be, it, it does need to be done. So um, I might um, turn to you, um, Mal. Now, you've got an interest in governance um, and getting the right outcome, and, it's, and, and governance is not just about getting the laws right, as the Banking Royal Commission showed us. Um, you know, there is, there is a, a, the ethical culture and there is proper um, meaningful governance um, that delivers not just on a mission, not, doesn't just produce a mission statement, but actually delivers on mission statements and the values that companies um, aim to have. So I just wondered if you could um, talk a little bit about um, the issue of, of, of the digital, digital risk here, the risk of getting things wrong and how governance principles might, you know, help us find a path forward. Thanks very much, Karen. Uh, and uh, let me echo your comments about what a wonderful two days of discussion in terms of governance, you know, my background, uh, whilst I'm in academia now, it's largely been in industry, and uh, I've spent quite a bit of my time over the last couple of years doing forensic assessments of failed digital investment, and usually it comes down to issues of governance. And when we talk about uh, you know, building trust and particularly trust in the community, uh, part of that comes uh, from uh, the belief that the organisations that are making decisions are actually competent in making those decisions. So that's that's the first point. Uh, quite often, though, that's not the case. And a lot of tech values happen because uh, of, I won't call them incompetent, but I will say that uh, decision makers not having sufficient digital literacy or digital competencies uh, to really understand what the risks are and, and how to deal with those risks. As we move forward into a world which will, I think, be uh, dominated by artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithms, making decisions, you know, the, to, to some extent, uh, our, we will be handing over our ability to make decisions to, to machines. Uh, so, you know, do the people in organisations that are around the leadership tables actually have the competencies to have the conversations? And uh, part of understanding risk in the technology space is recognising that risk is, uh, or technology risk is very different to other types of risks that organisations would typically deal with. Mm. And part of that is because uh, technology-based risk is difficult to see and touch and feel. You know, if you're uh, in the infrastructure business and you have a project underway to build a rail line or a road or a bridge or a building, you know, all the normal laws of physics apply and it's very visual what risk might, uh, might be there. Whereas in the technology world, we, these, these are often black box issues where uh, it's difficult to see and touch and feel. So for many organisations, they're not actually having conversations about uh, machine learning and the ethics of machine learning. Um, and worse than that, they're not even having conversations about the basics of digital investment at a level that would be uh, expected by communities. So... Moving forward, I think you know corporate legitimacy uh, and hence profitability uh, or their ability to meet their purpose statements 
will be determined by uh, ethical behaviour associated with technology because that's just the world we're moving into. Uh, you know, the reality is, uh, I think one of our speakers from yesterday mentioned that we have over a trillion dollars now um, in the Australian economy directly associated with digital infrastructure. So, um, you know, we, we have to be very transparent in our decision making with our stakeholders. And if you don't understand uh, the basics of, of the inputs into that decision making, then I think it's going to be very difficult for organisations to maintain their legitimacy in society. So governance is critical, mm -hmm. but uh, it starts with competencies and there's, there's a void there. Yes. Um, thanks, Mel. Uh, you know, I, I think there has been a bit of discussion about the, the, the ability to even have that technical overview. Um, and certainly um, I don't think there'd be many boards that would suggest that they've got all the competency they need uh, to, you know, review and monitor and, and um, assess uh, the implications of some of the technologies that their companies are, are, are utilising. Um, but I just want to note that um, I thought it was very interesting that ASIC just recently uh, uh, started to include cybersecurity obligations as part of directors' duties, um, which are actually, you know, will be enforceable. And I think that's, you know, that sort of 10 years ago, we would, never, we would have said, well, you know, boards just don't have that competency to make decisions about cybersecurity. Well, well, they've got to get it. <laughs> I think that's what Essex is saying, and maybe we'll reach the same conclusion in this space. Uh, who knows? But, you know, we just, just because we don't have that competency doesn't mean we just throw our hands up in the air and say, oh, well, you know, we'll leave it to the technologists, which brings me to my second point. <laughs> so, Simon, you headed up the, uh, we chaired the session yesterday on, um, uh, you know, looking at these issues from the technologist's perspective. And I thought it was interesting that one of the, one of the, um, the, the surveys or polls that was uh, that was cited in that session was that 92% of the participants of the, this particular poll said that uh, they thought technologists should be responsible for what they make. Um, and, you know, that's all good and well. Although having listened to um, Bill Simpson-Young say, well, the Muslim don't think about this issue, <laughs> that's a bit of a concern. But I just wonder what your thoughts were, just coming from that technology perspective. You know, are they ultimately where we should, uh, you know, put all the responsibility and majority of, majority of it? Yeah, thanks for the question, Karen. Um, yeah, I, I think we had in, in the session I chaired with Dr. Uh, Caitlin Curtis, who is from uh, the Centre of Policy and Futures at the University of Queensland. She was also going through some other surveys with, with similar types of, of part where I guess there is that expectation that the people developing the technology are the ones who are entrusted to be responsible for it. However, the sector itself doesn't see it like that. So there's this sort of broader dissidence. It's also interesting where there was another um, survey put through yesterday of like who is most responsible for building trust in these emerging technologies. Uh, and it was basically an even tie across government, technology and users and, and researchers and academics weren't actually included as part of it. So in a lot of cases, I think it's like, we've got this hot potato that's sort of sitting there and People, uh, people aren't necessarily knowing who and w who should come into it first or how they should do that. And I think that's coming through. And you know, as you mentioned, the comment of this sort of earned trust piece is a really important part. And I think just that, I guess, as a broader community, we're yet to get that language of, well, who are the people that are actually in the process of doing that, where there's, you know, some degree of scepticism if it's driven purely from the private sector, review that government itself isn't necessarily... Um, adept enough at knowing and, and to that extent probably users too and then the role of researchers and academics very much is in like hey we're just providing the information we're not here to implement it so it's really I think within this broader space that I think that, that we'll, we'll start to have some more interesting discussions as we're sort of seeking to try and, and bring forward and you know I think there, there was a question in our session with like do you think this is like a discussion about oil was 50 years ago. And the view was, is well, oil went through a crisis and because of that, it then shifted and changes what it was doing. Um, and I, I guess the broader question we heard is like, have we actually had enough of a crisis yet? Or are we starting to just see some of those fission points that we're alluding to with cybersecurity and others that might lead us to react rather than being proactive? But I'd hope through this forum and, and through everybody who's participating that we collectively here in Australia 
can, can be on the proactive step of that and being able to, to be ready for things that invariably will be coming across as the decade progresses. Yeah, thanks, Simon. I think, I think they're, they're, they're really good points. Um, we'd all like to avoid a major crisis or a major disaster um, because the damage can be, you know, have, have implications for decades. Um, and certainly, you know, I saw that there's a couple of really interesting polls and one of them, you know, talked about the role that... Um, you know, Australia could lead in this area. That I think, oh, sorry, um, seventy-two percent of the poll from yesterday said that they think that um, um, AI, ethical design, development, and use of technology is an area that Australia could lead. Now, we obviously don't lead now, and it's mostly international companies, but that doesn't mean we can't lead into the future. And look at what we've done with medical um, science and technology. So, um, so it's it's possible, um, and so it's even more incumbent upon um, Australia, if we want to lead in this area, to develop um, in the, and build into um, our, the regime um, ethical principles of ethical design, uh, principles of proper regulation, principles of responsibility and governance and all those types of things that make for um, a, uh, a, a globally um, marketable and respected industry. But, you know, we're early, early days yet. Um, just on that international perspective, um, Alex, I just wondered uh, if you, um, from, from, from your perspective with Google, have um, any thoughts about what we're doing well um, and what we're not doing so well, perhaps, if anything, um, or where we need to go from your viewpoint? Well, Australia is in an interesting position right now, and I think, um, as the panellists have said, it, that it brings that old quote to mind. It takes a lifetime to build a reputation, but a moment to destroy one. That means you need to do a lot of hard work over a long period of time and not make those mistakes if you want to build that trust. Now, Australia's uh, fallen behind the OECD when it comes to investment in digital technology. We're at the back of the pack um, with Mexico and New Zealand, but um, the government's doing a lot of the right things to, to start building up Australia's capability. And you know, people like to talk about how we might be a leader in something, but to be a leader in something, you need to get the fundamentals right. Um, the government has, for example, set up a digital technology task force within the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. There is now a lot of work going on at the Department of Industry in emerging technologies to understand things like AI and quantum computing and really set a pathway there. And we have seen, as, as has been discussed, some of the good work coming out of some of those institutions like AI ethics frameworks that are being piloted by a number of large Australian companies now. Um, now, these steps are just the earliest stage of the journey. Um, I, I think Australia, although we have not, we've fallen behind an investment, um, the debate is quite strong here around how we should govern these technologies, um, you know, the decisions that we should be making, where do we find a balance between um, the very strict regulatory net that um, restricts innovation and um, a more uh, innovation facilitative, facilitative approach. Um, these are questions that we need to ask ourselves. And this is exactly why the process of this public interest technology project that CEDA is managing is so important. And I think it'll be a great contribution to the debate. We are just starting out. I think as an industry, um, particularly outside of the technology industry, you know, we have a, an ethical framework in place where all both external cloud um, business decisions and internal product management decisions uh, are, are put through an ethical process, an ethical management process to make sure they fit with Google's ethics principles. But um, we will only find out what works collectively for all of us over time. I think we're here to participate in that debate as, as a company, as everyone else sitting on this panel is. And uh, we hope that Australia is going to move this debate forward over time now. I think there is the possibility for us to be leaders. We have good institutions, good people, and we're well educated, and we're doing the right things to take that journey seriously. Thanks, Alex. Um, it um, you know you touched on uh, you know what companies are doing. Your own company, um, my own company, IBM um, and Salesforce. We had um, uh, you have uh, Slesin. Schlesinger, uh, apologies, um, who talked about the processes they've got and they're, you know, very sophisticated processes like all of our companies have. Um, they have, you know, ethics by design. They have AI principles. Um, uh, and they have um, uh, 
consequence and risk spotters, which I thought was very interesting. <laughs> right at the end of the stage, you go back and think, okay, so if we implement this AI tool or this, you know, application, um, what are the risks? Uh, what are some of the consequences? And there are things that, that you know, n- none of us are perfect. That we don't see when we're focused on one aspect of it. So having that constant, you know, oversight and review, and that is something that Australia does do well. Um, but the important thing is, as you, as you know, we are now having the debate and it's it's coming from a body like CEDA, which is brings together everybody, um, you know, the regulators, the industry, the academics, the, you know, consumer bodies, experts, um, you know, not, not just, you know, it's, it's not just seeing as a responsibility of government, we'll just wait for them to come up with something or just let, let it rip and hopefully there's responsibility emerges from the private sector, which sometimes it does, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, but whatever the case, um, one of the things Australia does do relatively well um, uh, is, is engage with the public. And so this is something I wanted to ask Faye about because Faye is... Um, you know, without a doubt, an expert in, you know, public communication strategies and how to get meaningful engagement. Um, and now, how to meaningful engage with, you know, 25 million people is not an easy thing. Um, and we may not come up with all the solutions today. Uh, but, but I just wondered what you thought were, the, were the, um, the key issues or factors in effective public engagement um, in something like this and developing new frameworks that may, uh, that, it will if, uh, affect uh, the way in which we consume new technologies as well as the way we might ultimately regulate um, technologies. Uh, Faye, I can't hear you. I am the one. Um, Karen, that's actually a really important question. I think uh, we can all recognise that almost any um, project, organisation, crisis, failure, at some point during the review, looks back and says it was a breakdown in communication. And the critical success factors are taking so many of the issues canvassed over the last two days is that actually how well we communicate about it and how well we encourage that public debate. And the word you use which matters most is effective. You can have a lot of sound and a lot of noise, but to actually get change, what are the critical things? In my experience, it usually comes down to about you know, five key areas. And the first is being really clear on our objectives. Actually understand what it is we want to achieve in in the debate. What's the purpose behind it? Um, Then the second is recognising that you have different target audiences. It's not just everybody. When you say the public, the public can be cut and diced in so many ways. And we need to make a simple, you know, first, first cut is, are we preaching to the converted or are we attempting to recruit new believers? And part of the challenge with that is there's an assumption made that the converters are converted or that the potential new but true believers don't exist, that we actually, it's going to be hard to influence, identify, persuade them. And actually that's rarely the case. Most people, particularly where there is a personal interest aligned to the public interest, can be invited into the debate. And I think we need to spend a bit of time really unpacking what those factors are that will get them involved. I mean, the third area which matters most also is the approach we take. A lot of these um, situations where the issues are complex, there's a perception you have to be in the, in the tent or in the secret society to be a valid participant. And what we've seen in recent years is the expert versus the lived experience or the presumed lived experience, and we don't have much bridging. And I think CEDA plays a very good role in providing at least some common understanding for those two groups. So if you want to move forward with these things, the first step that we would have to do after the objectives would be actually recognise and define the common ground. Okay, where do all the parties already agree? So that's around some of those trust issues around outcomes, values, benefits, the fact that there are social benefits. I mean, the most biggest takeaway I've taken away from the last two days is that is very real economic terms that good ethics and good business are not mutually exclusive. And making that embed some of those key concepts is the common ground. Then from um, a general movement perspective, we've got to recognise that people's interests will diverge. And we have to plan for that. We have to expect it. 
we have to expect disagreement rather than act surprised and offended when it comes. Um, and the, then the role of persuasion comes into play. And that is where that earned concept, which was very much um, articulated over the last couple of days, you know, you had to build trust. You had to be trustworthy. So as a result, you have to plan for the conflict. And then in previous major movements we've had, I think, as a society, where we get retained or rusted on change as opposed to fashionable change, which is easily um, worn off, is where we take a multilateral engagement approach, not a bilateral. So in other words, the debate has to happen publicly. It can't be discrete corridor deals or organisations or in particular closed communities. It has to be a public debate because it's only going to embed change if it's public and people understand the basics behind it. So that's my, my main takeaway. I think I've been very excited over the last couple of days. The complexity of what has been covered, though, is initially scary, but in actual fact, I think the communications don't need to be complex. Well, thanks, thanks, Faye. Um, I, I, I agree. The, the level of debate, the knowledge that's already there, the thinking that's already take, been taking place, um, we're not starting, you know, from ground zero here. There's a lot of, you know, very uh, thoughtful discussion and research that's already occurred. And so it's a, it's a great building um, block for us to, to go forward. And I just, uh, just was thinking as you were talking, there was some discussion over the last uh, day or so about uh, stakeholder capitalism and stakeholder engagement as opposed to shareholder capitalism and shareholder engagement. Um, and to be successful, the, you know, the view put forward was that uh, it needs to be, you know, proper, genuine stakeholder engagement. Otherwise, you know, it is, it is not sustainable in the long run. Um, but look, I think we've, we've reached time. And um, so I wanted to uh, thank all of you, um, Alex, Simon, Mel and Faye, for uh, participating in this uh, short and sharp uh, summary session at the end. Um, and uh, I wanted to uh, hand back to Melinda with a sincere thanks uh, for pulling this momentous uh, forum together. It's really been quite an achievement to you and the very hardworking team that you have. Um, but it's certainly been a very, very worthwhile um, effort with some absolutely, you know, brilliant insights coming out of it. So, so thank you, congratulations, and I'll just uh, hand back now to you to uh, to wind up. Thanks, Melinda. Thanks, Karen. Um, we can do a little bit of you know mutual admiration pile on here because, of course, I did want to thank the um, members of the Public Interest Technology Advisory Committee at CEDA for their support. Um, in, in pulling this topic together and actually in investing their time and energy in the whole concept that um, actually putting people in, at the heart of technology and public interest at the heart of technology um, is the right thing to do because it will actually enable us to make the most of um, emerging technologies to deliver not just for our economy, which is sometimes so much of the focus, but also for society more broadly. And that's why when we think about our purpose through this advisory committee, it's very much about Yes, a dynamic economy, but also how can we enhance the choice uh, and well-being of individuals and, and communities? So they are very much the focal point um, of our efforts here. This forum has been about starting a conversation and in Bayes' terms, opening the tent. Um, this isn't about having um, complex conversations behind closed doors. It's about opening the conversations all throughout the last two mornings we've heard about collaboration, communication, earning trust, co-designing. Um, I'm a strong believer of um, that approach in the sense of managing both the opportunities as well as um, the potential risks and, and hazards that, that we, we must do if we're going to develop a sustainable approach and, and one that's in the best interests um, of Australia's sort of long-term future. Um, so thank you to all of the panellists who've been um, involved in this session. Can I also, of course, just thank all of the panellists that you've heard from and speakers you've heard from over the last two days. One of the really impressive things for me when we start having conversations on this topic is just how willing people are to just make their time available. We found it last year when Laura Manley came out from Harvard to talk to us about this as a sort of a warm up. Um, and I've experienced it again throughout, um, you know, putting together this forum 
just reaching across the world literally via email and having people respond um, immediately to say, yes, they want to be part of the conversation, I think underscores just how important uh, it is. Um, what next? Um, obviously, just a huge amount of information and really fantastic insights drawn out over the last two days. Um, we'll pull that together. I've committed to sort of getting something back to participants in terms of a sort of summary of insights and and things that I think we'll be looking to take forward at CEDA. I've already had some people reaching out to me uh, through email, so thank you so much for that. If you do want to be involved, if you've got ideas, we've heard that there is a lot going on. We absolutely don't want to recreate any wheels. We want to work with people to um, illuminate and accelerate and build momentum around things that are working and things that can have a really positive impact. So if you want to be in touch, the easiest way is info at cedar.com.au. Um, Otherwise, um, reach out to any of the CETA staff uh, that you know. Um, finally, um, a big thank you to our foundation um, partners and sponsors, um, IBM, Google, and KPMG. KPMG as well for all the fantastic drawings that you've been seeing throughout um, these two days, and we'll make sure they're up on the website. Um, and then it would be remiss of me not to say a huge thanks to uh, Hamilton and Izzy in particular from CETA, who've just worked tirelessly to pull this together um, and a bevy of other staff who've been uh, manning the pigeonhole and shooting questions through to me. And of course, to I've got to call out um, the streaming guys. Um, they're the ones that actually make all this happen digitally. Um, they have uh, been there with us as we've gone uh, to virtual events through the pandemic. They've done a fantastic job. So Josh, to you and the team, a big thanks. And with that, thank you everyone. And I look forward to catching up in the future.